It was my work. Well, it was my work, you know, as like a plumber or a bricklayer. We were bank robbers. Amongst our team, there was three ex-professional boxers and a couple of other teams had one or two or three, you know. And the, the, the similarity is quite natural because we've all come from a similar environment, you know, where you've got to fight. To, and, uh, you, and because you're top of the tree or were top of the, you know, you became boxers. And uh, we sort of knew each other through the boxing game, through the years. And then, of course, when one of you would say, oh, I know so-and-so, he'll be OK, because he's a bit tasty. So you'd approach him and say, like, you want to come on our firm, you know? So that's how it worked. <laughs> I've known him since he was 12 years old. He hasn't changed. Eddie Warlord, Eden Manor. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, died yeah of, he died of, in his late early 40s, wasn't he? Yeah. Eddie. Yeah. I don't know who that is. That's Cooper's. George. George and Henry. Is that George? Yeah. George and Henry Cooper in a minute. Oh, that's a change, Yeah, that's right, yeah. You know, give him a bit of stick. <laughs> well, Adam was a great... He was a, he was kind of a... He boxed me. He was, as, he was as good as I was, but he wouldn't train. So therefore he got beat. But he was he had all the class, all the pros, he had it all, you know, but he just wouldn't train. If a fighter hit him three times, he used to protest it wasn't fair. I tell you what, if you say that, I boxed him once and in a black eye after the fight, he pulled me in the dressing room, do you remember? And you said, look what you done to me. I said, what? I said, look. You hit me. Very yeah, you I caught me. I said, said what? I said, look, you blacked my eye. I said, what is the Obviously, nobody can say when they were born because they can't remember. But um, the Cherry family brought me up, whose name I, I've got now. Um, my father, they tell me, uh, I was born in South Africa. Unfortunately, my mother died at childbirth, my childbirth. And um, he was alone, I believe. And he came to England to, um, to find her parents to uh, unload me, so to speak but he had insufficient information. Through friends of friends, I uh, ended up with the Cherry family. That was in Kentish Town, North London. A knock on the door came one day and a policeman was there. And he said, uh, we've just found uh, these documents in a man's pocket who has been run over and killed. And can you identify him? And it was my father. And I stopped with the family from then, from there, then, one, then onwards. They gave me the name Alan Cherry. Why, I don't know. Well, why wouldn't they? You, your name is Alan, yeah? No, no, my name was Honey. It, it's spelled J-A-N-U-S, South African name. And uh, I had no birth certificates or no paperwork or nothing, so Vandenberg went out the window. They were a bit elderly to um, really take me in hand, and I was a bit of a wild boy. And I, uh, well, I suppose a tear away, really, in London. And uh, I was always fighting and scrapping and ducking and diving. I was like a young spiv. He was a useful fighter, but if he'd have put his, until I really put his, uh, he would have been a lot better. But I mean, he was one of the, like the sharp characters. He was always like having cigarettes, knowing how to sell a few cigarettes and that. He was a little rascal, he was. <laughs> Staying with the cherries, they weren't involved in crime. Oh no, no, so no. What, what do you think it was that made you move that, that, in that direction? Circumstances, you know, everyone was doing it. There was all, you know, it was just it was a natural thing, you know. For instance, 
You go down a place called Clarence Way near Camden Town. I went down there one day with my mother to the shops and the landmine had dropped between the flats. And there was many, many dead, I think 100 or 200 people dead from the shelters, who got killed in the shelters. And it blasted the shops out as well. Of course, there was tins of this and boxes of that all over the place. Well, what are you going to do, leave it? Now, you've got to remember, a 10-year-old in the war isn't a 10-year-old now. We had to, you know, take care of ourselves. The opportunities for plunder was ridiculous in London, you know, bombed out places night after night, day after day. You know, I can remember being at school where kids had come to school. I can just remember now their names and they lost their house in the night. Mother, father gone, brothers killed, you know. Look, if you're hungry, for example, and you're walking along the road, you're on rationings, and you see two tins of salmon on the floor, are you going to pick them up or leave them? We broke into a, with some friends, we broke into a shop and we took loads of food and that and we all got nicked, selling it. And uh, then I went to an approved school and it was called Mayford near Woking. And it was like, I can imagine looking back on it now, it had been shut down overnight. <laughs> the violence in there was unbelievable. And uh, we were like slaves, we were working out in the fields you know, um, do it all sorts of, you know, planting potatoes or picking them or gathering corn in and that, and for private contractors. And when we came home, we used to get an extra slice of bread and dripping, I remember, and a cup of cocoa at night for our labours. And then I bunked off from there and I went on a crime spree to stay alive. And um, they put me in prison, worm and scrubs, when I was 11. It was a big deal. God, I've been a prison, you know, a man's prison. You know, it was, uh, it wasn't, I think at the time it was a bit depressing, but uh, when I came out, it was like a bit of street cred, if you know. <laughs> I've known him, he used to live near me, and we used to go to the same school. But he was in the infants and I was in the seniors. But he, him and my brother were best friends. And, He'd been on to some Pankless Boxing Club and so did I. And we all, you know, we grew up together and knew each other and everything. At least half the kids I knew had been in Bullstall, Prove Schools or Courts or what have you. You know, they, it was, oh, so-and-so's been nicked, so-and-so's away. Oh, oh, I haven't seen you for ages, where you've been? I've been in, what happened? You know, wherever. It was uh, a, a done thing. Crooked rest for it. She's just Jesus Christ. I came out of a proof school and I was a bit of a nutcase. I'd fight at a drop of a hat. I wasn't aggressive, but you know, I loved to fight. And uh, so I went to the local boxing club, for St Pancras, and I could really punch. That was my big asset at the time. And I was knocking them all out in the gym. So they put me in the ring for a couple of times, you know, in a proper tournament, and I won. And then they put me in the British Junior Championships. And I'd only had about eight fights in my life. 
and they won the North West Division, the London ABA Championship, and they got to the finals of Great Britain. You know, that was going some for a kid with nine fights. He was, he was just lovely to watch. He used to, he, he wouldn't train, he wouldn't do nothing. He used to smoke like 20 players a day, and that's how he was. But he'd get in that ring and he'd give a performance like he'd never seen. He was great. He used to roll on the ropes. A classic boxer, you know, really lovely. We had to go in the army because national service, and uh, I had a wonderful time in the army. Really did. But I was lucky. I was uh, treated like a pet. We had a good time though, didn't we? We had a great time, yeah. Oh, fantastic. I mean, our national service done us good. Oh, yeah. Best two years I can remember. When you got in. Oh. We all done our six weeks army training. You know, rifles, mag on, mag off. We all done that, but after that it was kind of, we were boxing for the country. I was in the army boxing team and the most successful boxing team of all time, you know. So I was very, very lucky and fortunate. And good, of course. We was all in the army together, the national service. And there was Henry and Georgie Cooper was there. And another load of good fighters, Dennis Booty and all these people. But they was on their sort of last six months of their two years national service. And we all got moved up to Chilwell in Nottingham, of which we formed the 6th Battalion boxing team. And Alan was in that, we was all together. We were all excused boots. I got excused uniform because I, I it was too rough, it made me itch. So I excused uniform. <laughs> I, I, went, we, we, I suppose he'll come back on a Sunday and he taught me back to coming back on a Monday with him, with Nicky. We come back on the, on the Monday and they let him go and they put me in prison. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. We were the cream of the cream, there's no doubt about it. And because it's like a cup final, this you fight in, you know, all, all, every regiment. You know, there is, at the time there was two million people in the army. Could you imagine then? You know, national service, and uh, so it was a coveted prize. It's the the prize of the army. You know, the army boxing championships, and we generally win ten one, nine two, sometimes. 8-3, it you know, wasn't very often. And when three of you lost, did they give us a bollocking? Two of you lost? What went wrong? What went wrong, yeah. What, what, what were you what doing? We only lost two bad, you know. And it was a great little team, and, uh, and, and I hold a record for the most knockouts at, 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 in one contest. Every one of the team went out and knocked their opponent out, you know. So it's in the, in the boxing records, this is. They couldn't get the gloves on fast enough. It's true that, you know, you're sitting down getting your gloved up to go in the ring in, three, in, in a few minutes' time. Quick, quick, get in, quick, get in. So you get in, and it's a bloody hell, getting his gloves on. Quick, quick, get in. There's another one gone. We, so they had to give an hour between the two halves, you know, because it was being all over in like 20 minutes. And then, then the second half of the team got on. Everyone got knocked out. It was 11 nil. We beat them 11 nil. It was 25 past eight, and we had an interval. And Eastlake was saying, make it go the distance, make it go the distance. But, but once we was up there, once we'd done this, we won the championship, like when we had the 11 fights, we was like gods, wasn't we? They, we was at, they was bowling to us there, you know, because we used to come home Thursday, box the weekend, come back Monday, how'd you get on? We won, we won, we won. They said, we're well, fighting a load of fairies down in London. So, because when we had the actual thing in our own depot, but you remember after that we, was we used to have permission to go into the cookhouse. Yeah. We had cook, and we all cooked our own breakfast. In the cook, we was the only and we'd be, uh, you know, we'd be in our room and uh, an officer, Nick, an officer who, who had, we we had it, we it, our old fat you know, and we'd all <laughs> dodge under, dodge under the, the <laughs> sheet. <laughs> we used to have a tracksuit, tracksuit order, long hair, you know, all sideburns. No short hair, us we had long hair, DAs, you know, because that was the time. Up to the front of the queue, the guards used to look at us. Where are you going? Special food for us, thanks. That Shackleton, he was funny. When we all first got in there, he was, we were all young and he was getting on like he was 40 odd. He was 40 odd. He must have been then. He still odd. thought he was 16. We used to go running over a tank course, which was up and down like where they used to test the tanks out in the army there. 
we had to have we had to have our like small pack on our back on our back, and we used to what you had in the small pack was your mess cans, your water bottle, and, a brick. and that was a bag. He no, he used to put. 12-bit bricks in these, put it on and run with it. And he said, if I'm an old man, I'm 40, I can do it, you can do it. Yeah, yeah, we, uh... right. <laughs> oh, I've got to tell you this. It was the finals of the British Championship, and the first thing worked away at the time was me. And that's the last bout. And it was 5 all, wasn't it? Yeah. And I'm going in the ring, and Ernie Shackleton's in my corner, and I was winding him up. I said, I don't feel very well. He said, you little shit. <laughs> and he started punching me in the back. He said, you bastard, you get out there and fight. If you don't win this, I'll knock the shit out of you. I said, all right, Ernie. Don't you call me Ernie, because we, no. So as we're going towards the, uh, the ring, through the crowd, he's still punching me. And he's sitting down, and he slapped me on the face of my life. And I put my hands up, he said, no, not me, him. <laughs> so I won, of course, and we won it. And uh, when we come out, you know, he was all over me. we just come back from Berlin Olympic Stadium. It was the semi-finals of the British Army Championships. We, we won semi-finals of the British Championship, you know. And we come back on a boat, because it was Eastern Germany then, we had to come by a train to the Hook of Holland to Harwich. And it was a flat-bottom boat. And our Sergeant Major, Ernie Shackleton, double champion, ABA champion, he was a bit dodgy on his feet. He had too many fights in his life, you know what I mean? And he was a bit, not punchy, but unsteady on his feet. And he kept <laughs> swaying all over the boat. And all the, uh, all the soldiers, all the soldiers was coming on leave, was all drunk. And they was throwing him in the hold, all sick and burping and that. And he hated drinkers. So I went to two MPs, I said, excuse me, our Sergeant Major's been celebrating. He can't stand up straight, he's gonna go over the side. I said, he's a bit of an handful. He said, don't worry about that. So they went and got two others. So they walked over to him and they said, Sergeant Major. He went, yeah. He said, um, and also he's lisped, lisp, lisped slightly. From, you know, his lip was, he said, I'm all right. And he said, uh, yes, sir. Will you come this way? And he went, no, I'm all right. They come this way. They all grabbed hold of him. He said, what, what? And they took him and they took and they opened up the hole and zonk in. And he come out covered in piss, urine, uh, sick. And he was stunk and he's <laughs> I've been all night in there and we went, oh my god, he said, No, I haven't been drinking, I haven't been drinking. And Cooper says to me, You bastard, because he said I said, Don't tell him you'll kill me. <laughs> oh, poor old Ernie. You was a cheeky son when you was young. I was a lazy bastard. Wouldn't train. Cheeky son. Would not train. <laughs> Paul Newman yeah. came out, someone up there likes me, right? Cherry was a ringer for him, absolute ringer, right? And I had the film on at the forum in Kentish Town. I know he's taking that thing. <laughs> and uh, him and my brother, because they were best friends, they went up to see it, right? Now they couldn't get him on it because all the other crowd hadn't come out, so they had to wait till the interview. While they're waiting there, all the young girls and women were coming up to Cherry asking for his autograph. They thought he was Paul Newman, but he was signing away like a good one.
because because it's it's something you've got to do. I mean, I've just lost two of my brothers. They've died. Uh, uh, one week, Christmas week, last Christmas. My other brother died in Australia. And, you know, people, you, you must go and see people and you feel guilty if you don't go and see people and then you hear that they're dead, you think to yourself, you know, oh, why didn't I go and see them earlier? Like Buster Edwards, I passed his stall when he had the flower stall at the Waterloo and he was on that paper, on that flower stall. On a Wednesday I saw him and, and two days later he hung himself. And I said, if I could have only stopped, took the trouble to stop and talk to him, I might have found out what it was put on his mind that was playing that, you know, and then I prevented it. And it, it, you feel guilty. When people do things like that, you feel guilty all your life. You know? uh, I was mixed up with a team, and we were robbing banks, armoured cars, you know, etc., etc., jewellery shops, uh, you know, for quite a few quid. Were you a different group from the group that were in the East End of London? Crime-wise, the same. But it, you got cliques then, gangs. You know, and of course, it, the same age of the, the Craig, for example, the Richardsons, they all started up the same way did, but in their plot. And we didn't, and we didn't go into each other's plots. We kept in our own. How many banks do you think you robbed? Well, actual, it's difficult. I should imagine what banks itself. Well, well, armoured cars as well. Uh, Twenty-five. When you go to work on thing like that, people think it's easy. You know, you got to go in there and have confidence, like being in a soldier in the army. You got to have hundred percent confidence in in everybody. For example, we went into one place. I won't say where. And I fired a shotgun in the ceiling and I hit a rose in the ceiling. And it came down and knocked me spark out. I was covered in blood because when they took the loot out, they grabbed me with them, you see. But, you know, could they expect that? <laughs> you know, it's a good team. The money's good. Make no mistake about that. But the buzz of doing it and after you're doing it is different. When you're doing it, you're on fire. I mean, it's like as though you had a dose of heroin in your arm, and afterwards, the come down, the call, and you think, and you talk about it with one another. So, oh, that was good, and this went nice, and that went wrong. We could have done better if we'd have done this. Or, and uh, the excitement is just out this world. It's just because everyone's your enemy. For instance, we had um, we did one bank, and opposite was a fire station. And you got all the firemen there, all well the way always in there. So what we did, we didn't want to have a fight with them. So we got someone to call 999 and got the fire engines out. And then we hit the bank. You know? <laughs> we did a meat packing factory, and uh, we had the box with all their all their takings in for Christmas, and we threw them over the back in the back of the van, crashed off. And as we shot away, the, the box rolled over, hit the back door, and fell out. So we lost that. Then another time, we had a armoured car and uh, <clears throat> we cut it open, got inside. There was four bags. We knew our time was getting very, we two minutes out. We took two bags, sacks. And when we got back to where we share out, it was full of sandwiches for all the, uh, for all the crews in the, in the demo. <laughs> that was a real bastard, that was. <laughs> we hit a bank and I ran up. The getaway car was here, and I opened the door and I jumped in in the back seat. And the next door woman, I saw, Excuse me, madam, I saw in the wrong car. And I got his mask on, she was terrified, and I got out. <laughs> was our, you know, that was our um, thing, you know, we don't want to hurt people unless it's, you know, it's uh, very, very sort of uh, on top, you know, to, to be captured. <clears throat> and we came out of a particular bank <clears throat> and the hooter went off because it was a crowded shopping centre and people lined the pavement like as though there was dignitaries coming out. And when we came out, there was, a, I believe, a plumber and uh, <clears throat> he took a wrench out of his bag and started hitting one of us. You know, it's not his money, is it? <clears throat> I'm not going to give him anything. Well, he got well obliged, I can tell you, you know. They took him to the hospital, I promise you. 
but no bother, no. Oh, and a couple of times we've done ram jobs <clears throat> and uh, the people in the car has got this sort of bad arm or a bad leg. The same as us, we've been hurt as well. We did one ram job and uh, we forgot to open the doors before we did it. And when we got there, all the doors, all the doors were locked. <laughs> we couldn't get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we smashed our way out, but I'm just saying, we, we lost the we lost the lost the prize. We always used to use a Rover car, <clears throat> Rover ninety. They were like tanks, really solid cars. You know, there was nothing on the road to like, stand it. But at the time, you got to remember, we had such a crooked police force. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. The money I've given them, not for me, through me, for some other people. Unbelievable, and one of them, I bunged about 20 grand to, which was a lot of money then, he became head of the anti-corruption squad of Scotland Yard, I couldn't believe it, when his name came up in the paper. I know of one team where they were plotting up to do it, and an off a police officer from Scotland Yard was walking by, or driving by, stopped and says to him, I want my whack out of that. Well, what they used to do, you see, in order to get an arrest, they'd go and nick another firm and fit them up. Put a bit of forensic on them and what they, we used to have what they call verbal. You know, he said this and he said that, where well, it's not going to be allowed now because you have, you know, but uh, verbal. Every single case you had of not guilty plea, you had verbal. Every case without in a, any shadow of doubt. There's three men now who've just been released from prison after serving 24 years and I know who committed the murder. Now, no, they didn't. Now, I've got to tell you one story. One Christmas Eve, I'll never forget this, I'm walking around the exercise yard in Parkhurst, and there's a group of us talking, you know, going around, and they said, oh, the so-and-so brothers are here. I said, oh, I don't know them. They called them over, and all shaking hands. Oh, this is Alan, this is so-and-so. I said, how long are you doing? To one of the brothers, he said, 10. I said, oh, what did you get that for? He said, so-and-so, so-and-so. I said, they nick you for that? He said, yeah, I said, I had that. He said, what? I said, I had that. And he called his brother up and said, tell him, tell him. I said, yeah, I had that. And I told him things about the trial. He, he went, bloody hell. No, no, they fitted him up. I had a guy straightened at the yard. And I was coming home one night, and, I, and I, as I got out of the car, he flicked a, a light went on the car. You know, a fed light, flick on and off and off. I went up. I said, hello, Jerry. I said, what can I do with you? He said, what can I do with you? He said, I've got some information for you. It's going to cost you a monkey. Now, a monkey then, 500 pounds, was a very, very tight wad. You know, 500 quid could do a lot. I said, it's got to be bloody good for 500 quid. He said, I want it first. I said, no, no, I'll, you tell me. And I'll... He said, I want it first. So I said, all right, then. So I went and got it, and I gave it to him. I said, what is it? He said, get out of this area. In fact, if you can, get out of this country for at least six months. You're next to be fitted up. There was, um, would you rob a jewelry shop? I won't tell you where it was, but for obvious reasons. And, um, Four of us were going to do it. But this wasn't my firm. Just another firm. I was contracted out. Because if you was contracted out, what you earn from them, you've got to share with your mates, with your own team. So anyway, I had to meet these people at Tottenham in a ringer as a, you know, change car. So when the car pulled up, there should have been three in there. I was the fourth. I've opened the door and there's four in there. So I said, what are you doing here? And the bloke in the car was a bloke I you know, knew quite well. And he said, oh, I'm coming. So I said, Jesus Christ, that's changed everything now because what job does what? You know, I do what? And, it, and I, I said, well, I'm doing crowd control. That was my job. And he said, no, I'm doing it. And he brought out a, a gun. I said, what's that? He said, oh, he said, that I'll get, I said, no, no way, no, 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 you're a nutcase anyway. So he said, well, he said, I said, look, just forget it. I said, what, I said, 
just forget it. And I walked off. Now, I parked my car just round the corner. My real, my the genuine car was an MG. And they've gone. Now, this is where a bit of luck I had. I'm sitting in the car fuming because I'm not going to work. A woman drives in the back of me. She started a car, wallop, and it's, it's railway arches, you know. It, 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 it's ridiculous. And I got out and I was so angry because of this. I swore at her. I don't think I used the same word twice for about a quarter of an hour. And she's crying. So I'm, so I'm sorry, you know. But fortunately, across the road, across the court cobbles, was a, a, a Peter panel beater. He thought, oh, work. So he's come over, he said, oh, what's the matter? And my uh, back mudguard was against the wheel. So he said, I can have that repaired tonight, have it done by tomorrow morning. I said, OK. And while this happened, a policeman came along. Hello, hello, hello. He never see one normally, but what he's doing back there, I don't know. And he said, anything I can do? I said, no, it's all been settled. No insurance. So anyway, he still took particulars of the cars. The next day, turned the radio on, man shot dead at so-and-so, so-and-so, on the jewelry robbery. I mean, Jesus Christ almighty. Oh, knock on the door, I'm down the nick. And they said, you've been talking to him, and he was like, don't know nothing, don't know nothing. And I'm fighting her, getting fitted up here. And uh, one of them is a friend of a, JP, so uh, he, they hadn't had him in there. So they said, where was you on such and such a time? And I said, oh, I had a, the accident at Tottenham. They said, what were you doing there? I said, nothing to do with you, I was at Tottenham. And a woman ran in the back of me and, and the car's up there, because they'd done the checkup, on, and they brought her down to the police station. And I'm sitting down, because I'm not in custody, Officially, I'm sitting down and she walked in. She said, That's the bastard. She said, That's the one. She said, I Whatever he's done, I want you to send him to prison for life. What he said to me, she went absolutely apeshit. They had to throw her out. When you go sick in prison, if you're sick and you go in front of a prison doctor, it's, uh, for example, what's the matter? Bad leg. Look at the leg. Oh, two days rest in cell, aspirin water, out. Next one, Smith, yeah, what's the matter with you? Toothache. Ah, see the dentist, aspirin water, two days rest in cell, in, out, in, out, in, out. I can't blame the guy because some of them go sick every day. And I went in there with an itchy, itchy neck. Can you believe that? An itchy neck. And I went, I like, this is driving me crazy. And it was genuine. I was in there 20 minutes. They saw something. And uh, within a month, I was in hospital and an, and an operation. And he, he found a tumour on the brain. And I've never, never gone to a doctor outside for that. So that saved my life. Watch what you're doing. Come on, you're going to go ask that red otherwise. I don't know if you know the reason why he broke all his legs in that. Because his mother died while he was in prison and he escaped over the wall. And as he's and he broke both his ankles. That's why he's got the stirrups on. No, it's not true. I went to my mother's funeral after this. They let me out for that. Can you believe that? My leg ring calipers for two reasons. One was for the brain operation, which has made me lame one side. But before that, I um, broke this leg in seven places. Well, the ankle, actually. And uh, I was in custody in Maidstone Jail. And we had a governor there, his name was Robin Finch. He was a bit of a uh, bigot in a way, but he was a religious crank. Can you imagine a prison governor? And his wife was a real do-gooder, but she was in a show business, a loose sort of way, and she used to get loads of shows there, more shows than anyone out of prison. Quite good too. And because uh, they wear clothes, obviously. Well, we broke into the back of the, where they had the uh, outfits, dressed up, 
And uh, we got onto the wall, which is a very high wall. And when I sat on top of the wall, I could see they're all on exercise yard going round over the buildings, over the condemned building actually, at the con where they condemned people years ago. And they were walking around in exercise and I was waving goodbye to them, see? And they were waving back and go on Al, good old Al, because I fell off the wall. <laughs> I was in prison four times, uh, 18 months, uh, three years, uh, 10 and six. Well, if you look back on things, you say, well, I don't think I'd have changed it. It was the way of life. It was my work. Well, it was my work, you know, as like a plumber or a bricklayer. We were bank robbers. <laughs>